so now that we've been introduced to the idea of evolution, let's talk about more historical developments that led up to evolution. Let's first remind ourselves of these four key observations. Um, species are well suited to their environments. There are deep similarities between different species. There's this enormous diversity of living things and of course fossils. So let's look at some historical developments about these four different things. First, in 1676, we discovered a large femur. Um, and this was from a rock quarry in Cornwall. Um, it was given to Robert Plot, the professor of chemistry at, at Oxford. And of course, you know, it was the 1600s. At the time, they thought it was possibly a giant biblical human. Do you know what it was? If you guess dinosaurs, you are right. Um, and of course, in later years, we discovered more and more large lizards um, in the British Isles. In 1842, it was officially named Dinosauria by Sir Richard Owens. Um, Dinosauria means terrible lizards. I love looking at the etymology of different scientific names because it really gives a really nice uh, idea of what these different words mean. And a lot of them are super fun. Um, and this was the discovery of more fossils showing us that things were changing and the earth wasn't always like it is today. And that is definitely a chink in the chain of the uh, Scala Naturae and essentialism as a whole. Um, but let's talk about some other big leaders and other discoveries that happened along the way. Here we have Georges Louis Leclerc, the Comte de Buffon, um, and he lived in the 1700s. Um, he linked the environment to variation. He noticed that animals looked different and that was related to the environment with which they lived. He also had a theory of American degeneracy that the Americas were not as productive, so the animals there weren't as fit or as good as the old world. Um, this was actually disproven by Thomas Jefferson, though uh, if you look at some people here today, he might have something, there might be some truth to what he said. Um, unfortunately for him, he didn't have a mechanism to, for this change to come about. And this is really the problem in everybody up to Darwin. There was really no mechanism to prove these linkages people were finding. Here's another great quote about evolution. The strongest and most active animal should propagate the species, which should then become improved. So this is uh, very similar to other things I hear today in modern media about evolution, but this still isn't actually the Darwin we, we're talking about. This is Darwin's grandfather, Erasmus Darwin. We still have a little bit to go before we're getting to Charles. Some other important insights came from the field of geology. This is uniformitarianism. Um, and this came about by Charles Lyell and James Hutton. Um, here are two important books, Principles of Geology and Theory of the Earth. And they noticed that if you look at geology today, you can observe very slow, gradual changes. So they looked at streams and riverbanks. And if you look very closely, you will notice in some space spots, the water takes grains away. It's very slow, but it takes a little bit away. And in other places, it deposits them. So some places will be eroded and other places will grow. You have to be very careful to notice this because it happens on such a small scale. But if it, um, with thousands or millions or billions of years, that's when you're going to get a big change in the geology of the world. The idea of uniformitarianism is that geological processes are uniform over time. So if we are observing these small changes today, then that's what we can expect in the past. So if geological processes are uniform over time, to get such tall mountains and deep valleys that we see today, that implies that the earth is very old. So this was another debate in the day. Was the earth old or is the earth young? And people of the school of thought of uniformitarianism were some of the first people to argue that the earth was very, very old. Let's talk about Georges Cuvier again. Um, he did not like the idea that the earth was very old. So he came up with a different theory called catastrophism. Uh, wonderful name for a theory here. Um, and he also noticed that, you know, that we have different species of elephants as fossils in different parts of the world. But he didn't like the idea that the 
earth was old and that geological processes were uniform. So he thought that extinction happened through catastrophic disasters. And at these different um, periods that there was one point in time where things were all of a sudden a lot different, things happened all at once, and then after everything was extinct, everything would be replaced by new species. So kind of similar in form to some of the ideas of what happened in the Old Testament of the Bible. Um, again, he separated our Asian and African elephants, but he didn't think they were related. He just called them different types, and he did not ascribe to the idea that different species that may look the same would be related to each other. Um, he did think that the environment molds the animal, so he did have some, you know, I, uh, inkling of an evolutionary way to think of things, um, but he thought these similarities were due to shared functions. Um, this is similar to what we call homoplasy today. Um, and he also um, thought that organisms were made of integrated parts. So we have some ideas that match some of our understanding of biology today, but other ideas he held do not match um, how we view biology at the moment. Um, someone who liked to debate Georges Cuvier a lot was Geoffrey Saint-Hilaire. Um, he had different ideas. He was noticing that there was a unity of composition between many different organisms, um, and he also uh, used the term evolutionary accidents. So these relate to two terms we talk about a lot now, homology and mutations. So let's talk about homology. This is a very important concept. Homology, homo, is same. This means similarity of traits due to shared ancestry. So let's look at some examples. So here, all of these creatures, we have the same bones in our forelimb. We have a humerus, ulnus and radia, um, carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges. And all of these, we have the same bones. They've been modified in different forms because we all move very differently, but we have that similar structure. You can also see that in pretty much every other bone in our body. So here we're looking at our scapula. Ours is on our back. Um, looks actually very similar to the mouse here, um, though the chicken and the turtle have very different looking scapulas, but they are the same bone. Let's contrast that with homoplasy. So homo still means same, so we have some similarity here, but now we have plasy. This means the appearance of similar traits due to common function not common ancestry. And when we are looking at traits, we do want to try and figure out, are they homologous or are they homoplastic? Um, one confusing thing here is there are actually two different synonyms for homoplasy. So you might also hear the words analogy or convergence. This just means the independent evolution of a trait that looks similar. Let's look at an example here. So in this tree, um, we are, noticing that both mammals and birds, the group Avis, are homeothermic. This means we generate our own heat. Uh, and we are not, you know, beholden to the outside to keep our body temperature up. If you look at our ancestor right there, it goes pretty far back. Our common ancestor probably did not have homeothermy. That was most likely independently derived in mammals and birds because you can see everyone in, with, in the middle here doesn't have homeothermy. And they are, it is unlikely that they would have lost it. So this is evidence for the independent evolution of homeothermy for um, similar reasons because it helps us um, be able to go uh, and live in a variety of different environments. Um, we can also see homoplasy in a variety of other traits. Birds and bats independently evolved flight. We can look at that a little bit farther. So this is an interesting graph that everything that is purple is analogous. So wings are analogous between these different creatures, between um, insects, uh, we have a pterodactyl, a bird, and then a bat. All of them evolved flight independently. Though you might notice we have the four limb bones on the three at the bottom, those bones are still homo homologous. So you do want to make sure you're careful about how you're using these words. The next important figure was Jean Baptiste Lamarck. He lived in the late 1700s and early 1800s, and he is the first person to come up with a hypothesis to explain the mechanism for change. His 
theory was inheritance by acquired characteristics. So his theory was that an individual changed over its lifetime. And it changed based on the use or lack of use of different features. And that it would change by environmental need. His classic example was that of a giraffe. So a giraffe really, really wants to stretch its neck so it can reach higher leaves on the tree. And so it does. And it's this inner need that is driving this. Uh, we do know that this is not true because if you lose a limb in your lifetime, your children are still born with all of their limbs. They actually tested this by cutting off the tails of rats. Not very nice, but it got the job done. Um, and we, can also, we also know that other things that you do while pregnant will not affect your child. Of course, that doesn't go for drugs. Doing drugs when you're pregnant has drastic negative consequences. Please don't do that. Um, so a lot of people like to give Lamarck flack because his theory was wrong, but I think we don't give enough, him enough credit. Um, even though his ideas did not turn out to be true, he was the first person to have a, a proposal for a mechanism for evolution, and that is still really cool. And Darwin himself was affected by Lamarck a lot, so thank, thank you, Lamarck. Another important notice um, that affected Darwin a lot was the uh, works of Thomas Robert Malthus. He wrote an essay on the principle of population, and he's actually the person who coined the term the struggle for existence. So Robert Malthus er, was really, really con concerned about overpopulation. Um, it's interesting that he was so concerned at his point, which like it's so much worse today because he noticed that, sure, we are increasing the amount of food we can produce, but the um, rate at which we are increasing how much food we can produce is about linear, and the gr population growth we are experiencing is exponential. So because we have the population growth is so much higher, at some point we're going to have a little bit of a crisis. So you might hear this called a Malthusian trap in this graph. I've also heard it called a Malthusian crisis. And that is the um, point which there are so many, many more people that we just cannot feed. Um, this might seem a little bit familiar if you've watched um, major blockbuster movies in the past couple of years. Um, one of the things I saw after uh, Infinity War came out um, with some people like, why couldn't Thanos have used the Infinity Continent to just create more resources? Well, we would just run into the same problem a little bit later, because if resources are increasing linearly, but populations are increasing exponentially, we'll just run into the same problem a little bit more. Not that it makes it right to kill off half the population, but that's why simply creating more resources just staves off a future crisis. So let's remind ourselves of all of the biological insights. We're seeing species are very well suited to their environments. We see deep similarity in all parts of different organisms. There's just so many different living things out there. Different animals are alive at different times in different places. The earth is very old, thank you geology. And we're seeing this competition for limited resources. So all of these things are the insights that Darwin is working with to come up with his theory. So, can you describe these in your own words? What biological insights support evolution?